The news is droning on in the bedroom, and she brushes her teeth, listening to commonalities of deaths to pile up on the highway, to tell people a tragedy will inconvenience their commute, and she thinks back to her childhood, standing on a subway platform, listening to dying screams while businessmen in suits stood in circles and complained that the jumper had made them late. And she is 11, and she is desolate. Mothers stand, children whining, hipsters tr plat prattling to friends about clothes, and the only one crying and trying to catch a peek is the bantam girl in her first year of traveling alone. And maybe life is always like this, strangers ignoring the unpleasant things in life as if pretending others' pain away has the same effect on theirs, so they look away from vagrants and crying children, death, in favor of a shopping list. The toothpaste, the skim milk, the vitamins for your son. I want you to think of an image. Um, and it doesn't have to be beautiful, though that usually does the trick. Um, just something that makes you feel. And Construct a tableau in your mind down to every last detail. Close your eyes. And this can be anything from the phrase in a tablecloth to the exact rhythm of a gutter to the way someone's eyelashes look when they're staring into a coffee mug. And construct the scene around you and fit the pieces together like a puzzle until you can even smell the faint scent of stale coffee and the cold linoleum under your bare feet. And just hold it for a moment and let it linger in the front of your mind for a while. You're in that place. In this moment, you are simultaneously here and there. And that is the beginning of something beautiful. Writing for me, and I think for a lot of writers, is part escapism, part obsession, and part compulsion. Uh, there are times when I'll wake up in the, middle of the night in the middle of the night with an amazing idea for a novel scene, and I'll write it down, even if I have school the next day and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, or if it takes me an hour, because I know that it won't be there when I wake up. Devotion then means reading from page 1 to 165 and editing out all the 2 a.m. grammar mistakes. But more than that, I know that without writing, I would have no space for anything else up here. I would be too full of all the random drivel I commit to paper. And I already am, to be honest. I'm always debating scenes, writing, how I would have done this differently in whatever published book I've recently read, which is a little bit ridiculous because most editors should know better than high school students. Um, but all people, even if they claim they don't know how to create it, know beauty. They know what it is, and they know what it looks like, and they have an appreciation for it. And I think that even if you feel like, oh, writing isn't something I'm into, it's not something that I'm good at, appreciation leads to creation. Hence, all the little ideas that we write down, that we scribble in notebooks when we're not paying attention to teachers, can be turned into something creative, something that can have a profound effect on other people. And you can characterize moments, be it in a kitchen or watching a man die from a subway platform. I think that writing, if it's about anything, is about that moment at the end of a brilliant piece that creates a little hitch in your throat, where you know that you've heard something beautiful, that you can't recapture that moment, be it listening to Billy Collins or Suher Hamad, whether it be through vocal cords or capturing an entire character in ink. You can find connection through poetry or novels or newspaper articles. All forms of writing are essentially about connection, about the bridge from one human being to another. And in the end, a story starts with a seed. People may see what they want to see and hear what they want to hear, the old adage, but someday somewhere you saw something that no one else saw, or maybe saw something in a way that no one else has ever seen it before. And all it takes is that one idea for you to create something. I mean, if you think about the great, maybe not the greatest books, like Harry Potter is intensely popular, right? But it's not just because, oh look, there's dragons, there's Thestrals, all these cool things are going on. It's, what makes it connect to people isn't Death Eaters or Quidditch, it's that we can see ourselves in his shoes. And for the moment when we're reading that book, we can feel what he feels and understand the trials that he's going through. I mean. The things that he experiences, the indignance of awkward relatives is something I'm sure we've all experienced, or pain or loss, uncertainties, not knowing where you come from or where you're going or what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Two people die every second. Think about that, two people every second. Who's to know, maybe I'm next. And if you can capture that sense of morality, that, sorry, not morality, <laughs> mortality, um, humanity, and if you can characterize it in a moment, then you can turn it into something beautiful. If you can make something like fear or death or loss beautiful and relatable, then 
it becomes an invaluable gift. It becomes more than the poem or the novel. It becomes about this connection, not just between two people, the reader and the author, but between you and you and me and every other living creature on the planet. Writing is, at its very core, about naming uncertainties, about walking where angels fear to tread. Fantasy creates villains beyond mortal ken. Poetry uses a handful of syllables to pin the butterflies in your stomach and make them something corporeal. Writers give life to the non-existent and name unnameable sensations, and the satisfaction is in that moment when finally, the reader reaches the end and feels that hollow ache in here where the words have been. The beauty you capture lies in the melancholy at the end of a good book, and that is what you're looking for, what writers scramble in the dark to find. And I guess on that note, I would like to finish with an excerpt of one of my novels called Halflings, which draws on Irish fairy folk tales about um, humans falling in love with the fairies, or what they call the fae, um, and my own experience as a multiracial American. As you know, some people take after their mother, some after their father, and in this novel, some are forced to go through the change and become a fairy, which, as you'll find out, is not something very fun to do. So. That night, Terry had dreamt of the midnight revel. The fae were leaping in time to the slow, lilting ballet of the elfin instruments. The pipes trilled like the wind in a summer storm, whistling through the warm trees, accompanied by the lightning flash of the bonfire and the heavy, thundering swell of the instruments. He watched the dignified primality of the fae moving in a swirl of color, mesmerized by spider silk dresses in bright berried hues, the blinding movement of twig-thin fingers flickering over sleek corn silk pulled taut over unrefined wood. The moon shone like a lure in the water, beckoning softly through the laced canopy, and on the other side of the sky he could see Mika, face pale and accusing under the veil of whisper-thin clouds. His mother was smiling, dressed as a maid, ironing court robes and coated in a fine powdering of stardust, and suddenly in the swirl he was falling, down through a chorus of high, clear laughter ringing like bells, straight into the greedy embrace of the flames, licking at his body and setting his insides alight. The pain was excruciating, and he could feel each organ as it was consumed by the fire, First the lungs, air eaten away by Prometheus' gift until he lost the capability to scream, his mouth a silent O in the bright gold light, and then the stomach, nibbling through the lining until the acid spilled out and began to erode the rest of his flesh, the fire finally touching his heart and setting each individual vein alight, the way flame follows a trickle of gasoline. Terry! Terry sat up with a start, panting, his heart hammering hard against his chest. Sweat was beating across his skin, trickling softly down his spine, and he curled into the fetal position as pain racked his torso with a series of violent spasms, swearing colorfully. Terry, can you hear me? Look at me. Terry opened his eyes to the familiar darkness of his bedroom. Mika, he whispered, voice raw, and a hand reached out from the darkness to touch his shoulder. He moved in reaction to the contact and cried out in pain as something twisted like a knife in his chest. Crap! Terry, this is going to hurt, okay? Something cold pressed along his spine and for a moment there was a second of relief as the fire tearing through his torso began to ebb. Then, everywhere it touched began to smolder. Terry could smell his flesh burning, the slow, sickening hiss bubbling behind him and making his eyes water. Then the fire extinguished itself completely, and he gasped. Stop, he ground out, and the object was moved immediately. Terry, I'm, I'm sorry, God, are you... Mika stopped, and Terry rested his head in his knees for a moment, con concentrating on his breathing. Each inhalation seemed impossibly deep, and he let out a soft break, barking laugh of incredulity as he realized what had happened. The change, he grasped. My organs. I know, Mika said, and he felt her forehead touch his shoulder as the bed dipped to accept her weight. Christ. Terry paused, breathing for a moment as he got his bearings. What, what did you do to me? Mika stiffened beside him, and he could feel her shifting uncomfortably. I met a halfy. It's halfling. Don't waste your voice, she snapped and Terry smiled softly in the dark. Anyway, she was part siren, and she told me if I had to stop the change. Mika stopped, closing her eyes. She said there's a group that can treat it, that there are rogue fae help in New York helping people across the ocean. She laughed bitterly. She's a fool, of course. It's absolutely untrue. Terry opened his mouth to argue, but Mika stood up and turned on the light, causing him to blink rapidly. Hey, what are you? I used an iron pipe, Terry. She held up a long cylinder, her face drawn tight. It only irritates me, you know that, no worse than poison ivy. She said that iron always stops the change, so I asked your dad to pick one up at the hardware store a few miles away. 
She looked down. I guess I should have asked first, but no, it's fine, he interrupted, coughing somewhat. Mika's mouth was set in a thin line, her expression obviously distressed. I'll clean the wound for you. Let's go to the bathroom. Terry opened his mouth to argue, then closed it. There was no way to refuse her this time. Thank you.